You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, and this is Six Degrees of John Keel. Welcome to the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Barbara Fisher. Tonight, I'm talking with Joshua Kutchin. He is the author of a brand new book called Ecology of Souls. It's in two volumes, but it's one book. And it is not just lengthy. It is excellent. I have read it. And I have to give the caveat that I read it as an editor. So I've been keeping quiet about it for a lot of months. (laughs) So, welcome, Josh. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, the process could not have come together the way that it did without you. Um, I don't know what bolt of inspiration I had that that said that I should have you or ask you to be my editor. Um, but you know, it was. I think it was a really perfect fit, um, both in t- in terms of having an eye for detail and also um, for just being someone who is well-versed enough in this broad spectrum of topics, and it's not just a UFO book, it's not just a cryptid book, but it's also got a lot of older, you know, soul craft in it. And I, uh, and you know, also at the end of the day, somebody who calls me out when I say something that doesn't sound quite right. (laughs) There there aren't a lot of people who not only would do that, but whom I would trust uh, when they said something like that. So yeah, you were an integral part of this process. And um, as part of the deal, you get the first interview uh, <laughs> yep. about the ecology yep. of souls for better or for worse, I guess, because I'm, you know, as we were chatting beforehand, I'm not sure even I can wrap my arms around everything in this book, but I'll try. We'll see what my talking points turn out to be. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll give it a shot. Okay. First of all, I love the title. But it's one of those titles that most people are going to look at and go, uh, 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 what's that? What, what's an ecology of souls? So why don't we start with that? Well, the idea uh, for the title was kind of a jumping out point but for, because it's, it's a phrase that Terrence McKenna employed often. Um, I'm not entirely sure if he was the originator of the phrase, but he had the observation or the sense rather that whenever he would enter the DMT realm, it was almost as if he'd entered an ecology of souls um, because he had made numerous uh, comparisons of that realm to various afterlife mythologies. Um, According to him, he even quote unquote turned on a very prominent uh, Tibetan Lama uh, to DMT. And the the Lama said that's as, as close as you can get to the other side without you know, while still being able to come back. So he he referred to it as bungee courting into the Bardo. So I thought that ecology of souls was not only a good title for it, but also sort of a good model for what we are looking at when we're looking at the whole of the paranormal, Um, which I do think probably functions in a way similar to a a diverse and robust ecosystem. Um, So yeah, it's, it's a little bit oblique, but you know, you know, for the longest time, I was calling it the ghost book or the death book. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you can't, you can't call it the ghost book or the death book. It has to have a little bit of artistic flourish. So the full title is uh, Ecology of Souls, A New Mythology of Death in the Paranormal. And as you're aware, um, I went back and forth about like new mythology sounds a little bit pretentious. But I mean, it, I think it kind of is in some ways a new mythology because of how holistic it turned out to be, which is not something I was expecting at all. And and that's that's one of the things I really wanted to uh, discuss with you because you didn't expect it to be two volumes. You didn't expect it to be that in depth. You didn't expect to keep finding connections from so many different quarters, from so many different folklores, mythologies, uh, religious texts, texts, and uh, scientific 
papers. I mean, you've you've got the sources are all over the place. And I mean that not as the sources are like all over the place. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He <laughs> no, just yeah. he just he just read some books and you know, no, it's actually you you did the hard work of digging through everything and well, synthesizing I, it. I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the recognition from that. Um, I, so the, really the genesis for this was that I had always wanted to explore that Ann Streber quote where, you know, she had gotten a bunch of correspondence she and Whitley had after the publication of communion in 1987. And she had written among her observations, this is, this has something to do with what we call death. I was like, well, that's a great idea for a book because people do see aliens, sorry, they do see dead loved ones and alien abductions. And I said, well, let's, let's unpack that. And as you mentioned, like I thought that I could get in and out of it with one book and you know, it, it turned out to be such a broad topic that I was initially dissuaded. Like I remember lying in bed one night and I was thinking to myself, if I talk about this, I've got to talk about NDEs, which means that you've also got to talk about OBEs, which means that you have to talk about the higher self and souls and doppelgangers and all these things that just have to do with the soul. Because I think those all have to sort of remain in dialogue with one another. Mm -hmm. Um, so I set out, I said, okay, well, we'll just do a quick chapter introducing some of these concepts and then we'll get into the meat of it, which will be UFOs. And <laughs> I remember getting to like the like 120,000 word point and I'm like, I can get in and out of UFOs in 20,000 words. That's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is hilarious because in case anyone's wondering, practically the entire second book is, is the UFO book. Um, and really at its heart, I think it is the UFO phenomena really does sit at the heart of the book and trying to reconcile that with a lot of these older older uh, traditions. But, you know, along the way you end up picking up all these other things that don't seem like they should be related. Um, you know, like cryptids and ancient monuments and ley lines and the wild hunt and uh, obviously the fairy tradition. Um, so yeah, it, it just, it, it becomes this all encompassing thing. And that's when I realized that if you wanted to, and I'm not saying that it's correct. Um, I have some suspicions that some important parts of it might not be correct, but if you wanted to, you could frame the entirety of the paranormal within the idea that it somehow expresses our relationship to what we call death. And the book doesn't try to, you know, re reinvent what death is or reinvent ideas of afterlife. Like all those ideas in the book are pretty traditional simply because it's big enough as it is. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. No. You know, so, so while leaving some room for things like the stone tape theory and, you know, what are ghosts and is, is, is it some sort of time thing? Like just taking it from a traditional standpoint was, I think the only way to do it. And, you know, I wanted to just write the UFO book, but I said to myself, there's so much stuff here that it will devolve into a series of endless digressions, you know, constantly referring back and having to branch off to discuss these older ideas. So why don't you just write about those first? And that's what turned into the first book, which was a lot of that background. But what's nice, what's nice about that is that, you know, by the time you get to the UFO stuff, you can sort of just reference earlier things without having this giant mm -hmm. aggression. And you have the assumption that people at least have internalized some of those ideas a little bit more. Right. Yeah. I, what I like about it is if you look at folklore at all and the, the folklore that lots of people look at in, in the United States at least is fairy folklore and in, in Europe, if you look at that and then you look at UFOs this this comparison has been made since Passport to Magonia in 1965. So it's not anything new. But why? Why are there similarities? And then you start looking at, at, at folkloric motifs that are adjacent to fairies, mm -hmm. like the wild hunt. And then you start looking at mythologies that are adjacent to the wild hunt. And you have Norse and you have Germanic and you have British and you have French. And then you start going, well, if, okay, if fairies are connected to the wild hunt is connected to older pagan religions in Europe and fairies are connected to UFOs, then these are connected to UFOs. I mean, it's, it's, it's the mathematical property of if A is connected to B, then 
C is connected to B, it's also connected to A. There, there's, there is commonality. And I've always kind of sort of been like, there's, there's too many commonalities across the paranormal and across folklore and ghosts and, 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 and everything that what is the common factor and you dug it up and you tossed it in the air and said, it's death. And then, you know, and then I tried to disprove you as I was reading your manuscript. I'm like, he's full of crap. No, nah, I didn't really say that, but I was like, nah, it cannot. <laughs> no, that's be that good. Simple. That's good. Yeah. It cannot be that <laughs> simple. You know? So I kept going, nah, nah, nah. And then I was like, Oh, well, you know, I can't. Okay. I know that source. I know that source. He's right. Okay. <sighs> And I mean, a couple I, of things were a little bit shady in there, but you fixed it. So, well, I mean, you know, I think that <clears throat> I think that there are some very reasonable um, objections that can be made. I mean, so one of the, my biggest complaints about Terence McKenna's stoned ape theory, not the stone tape theory, but the stoned ape theory, <laughs> is that you know he thinks that uh, wandering tribes of hominids followed the herds and the herds defecated and from that grew psilocybin mushrooms and that in small doses increased visual acuity and sort of gave birth to language. One of the complaints that I've always given for that is like, I buy A to B and B to C and C to D and D to E, but I don't buy A to E. So I think you could probably muster a similar argument against this Mm -hmm. in some ways. Oh, you can. Um, But at the baseline, I do think that there is sort of and I, I have no intention of this sounding grandiose it's just where my head went there is sort of an unanswered question that lurks behind the entirety of passport to magonia which is people associated fairies with the dead you mm-hmm. know you see that time and again i, I go to great links in, in volume one to sort of emphasize that that was a universal thing that old world and new world right and um you know if that is the case and you know uh, simon young a uh, famous fairy folklorist says that, you know, before the rise of theosophic fairies, people mostly thought of fairies in relationship to the dead. If that's the case, then with that transitive property, I can buy the A to B to C that is the dead to fairies to aliens because the comparisons mm-hmm. between B and C are so strong and the comparisons between A and B are so strong that it really does seem that that coupled with the appearance of, again, dead people in alien abductions, which mm-hmm. nobody talks about, um, really does suggest that that is sort of what we're scratching the surface of. That, and I think there's another unanswered question or another unanswered uh, idea that sort of courses through that Kenneth Ring line of thinking, is I feel like a lot of those people of that time said, well, look, the shamanic experience looks like a near-death experience, looks like an alien abduction. Isn't that interesting? You know, near-death experiences bring you to the cusp of death, and many shamanic initiations do. I wonder what alien abductions could be. (laughs) And, you know, I think Mm -hmm. that the question in some ways is is kind of obvious. Not that I think that all all UFO contact, rather, should be nested nested on that NDE spectrum, but I think that at least some of it should, um, after taking a look at it from this perspective. Because all these, to use that, you know, the free um, organization's term, all these contact modalities really do look like near-death experiences. You know, the, the psychedelic experience does as well. The trips to fairyland do as well. And some, some cryptid encounters. It's not as easy to make those comparisons, but there are elements that are present in those as well. Um, and I think it all really does, or it all quite possibly could, revolve around that final transition that we make. What I, what I find really interesting about the idea of a final transition is how final is that and you really don't go into it but when you talk about an ecology of souls and when terence mckenna talked about you know he he would see this whole ecology of souls all these different beings all of these spirits non-material beings and how they interacted with each other I think it's fascinating to think that that may be human souls hanging around just on the other side of what witches and pagans and New Agers call the veil. And they're just waiting there to to interact with people. And then then there's the question, are they all human souls or are they not? Or is there a difference? See, there there's 
you answer a lot of questions in your book, but then you ask 50, every time you, you answer one or halfway answer one, 15 more jump up. Yeah. And I, and I touch upon reincarnation kind of as much as you can. And I think that that might be a big part of it, but I don't necessarily think that the Eastern model, which is sort of like a one-to-one relationship between people cycling through lives. I don't think that that is quite accurate from what I can tell. Um, not that's not an empirical statement. That's just sort of a gut feeling. Um, I think as you alluded to, it's more like soul energy is in a variety of forms and, you know, we're sort of hewing towards, you know, it's kind of a dirty word, but sort of an animus perspective, um, in that sense. And that this, this soul energy makes that transition. And from that, it just all mixes together and it gets drawn out and reassigned. Um, I think that makes a, that makes a lot more sense to me than, you know, the one-to-one, you know, oh, I'm the reincarnation of this person or that person. Because you do have people. I think <laughs> I heard a comedian who, who talked about, like, there being a society of, of people who believe in reincarnation and, like, three Napoleons show up, you know? <laughs> it's like... Yeah. And, and, of course, you know, to the to the skeptical atheist mindset, that, that rules out reincarnation. But that's because they're not considering, like, well, maybe you know, part of Napoleon is on all three of those people. And I think that something mm-hmm. like that, in addition to, and, and again, time is the biggest unanswered topic in this, in the, in these two volumes. Like I just don't, yes. didn't even touch time because again, the book, the book is long enough <laughs> as it is. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it doesn't need, we don't need to be going there, but maybe that's somewhere to go in the future. Not that I yeah. want to go anywhere, anywhere with <laughs> writing a book like this in the future, <laughs> but maybe that's some place to go in the future. And I have yeah, a little disclaimer. I, yeah. I remember getting to the end of it and being like, you know, you didn't ever mention time. And you're like, shh. <laughs> no, yeah, I did yeah. not. <laughs> nope. And, 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 I'm not and, going there yeah. either. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I, and, and part of that is the fact that it's a big topic. And part of it is that I just don't feel qualified. You know, that the time stuff makes me go cross-eyed, you know, grandfather yeah. paradoxes and stuff like that. Um, but, I mean, there's obviously something to it for sure. Do you hear that, Eric Wargo? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right on that. Here, here, Eric. Here are the books. You, you, you write the next one. You write the. You figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that would be that would be. The, you know the the thing that I like the best is I came to a lot of these ideas myself, but I didn't do it through research. I mean, there's some. Yeah, I know fairy lore. I know UFO lore. I know lots and lots of mythology. I know lots and lots of religious texts because I've read comparative religions since I was a kid because I wanted this stuff to make sense. It doesn't, but that's okay because <laughs> it's not necessarily about making sense and that's fine. Uh, but I, I came to it through my own understanding and um, through some psychedelic experience and you know, some of that psychedelic experience you can't even really quite explain verbally. It's more like gnosis than it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As as we say in the pagan community, unverified personal gnosis, uh, <laughs> UVP. Uh, U, UPV. Oh, God. No, UPG. I hate dyslexia right now. <laughs> um. So it's that's what we call it, and and uh, UFO researchers might want to learn that too, um, because the way I treat experiencers is I'm not going to tell them they didn't experience what they experienced. Ain't my job. It's not for me to do because I've experienced some weird crap, and I know how it feels to be told that oh you imagined it or you're crazy, and so it's that's not what I'm there for. Um, but you know, I've said it before, you know, what one person sees as a fairy and another person sees as a UFO, someone is going to see as an ancestor spirit. Right. And then somebody else is going to see it as a ghost and somebody else is going to see it, you know, on and on and on. You know, that's to, to me, that's the the small lights or the big lights. Those are seen as witches flying through the sky in some places. It's seen as evil spirits. It's seen as good spirits. And, and you know, all of the above may or may not be correct. 
sometimes mm-hmm. even sometimes even at the same time, you know. Um, yeah. So, something I think that you were alluding to, which um, came up in the Where Did the Road Go Slack discussion that we were having, is is this idea that that idea of personal knowing and not having to prove one's own experiences and one's own really quite frankly gnosis um i think is a really admirable approach to the phenomena you know where you you get a lot of these you know as as the phrase goes old white dudes who want to like catalog every little aspect of the phenomena and try to place people into different groups and we've got these different factions of aliens doing this and that and the other and it's like well that's that's not even what it's about like when you I mean, I guess you can, I mean, it's the, it's the cryptozoological impulse too, right? Bag it and mm-hmm. tag it and, and, you know, catalog it. I don't think that that's, I think that's a, that represents something of a fundamental misunderstanding of the phenomena. Now, the ironic thing is that I just, I, I tried to just do the same thing here, right? Like I tried to collate a bunch of data and figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, at, but at the same time, like it, the, the idea of, I mean, that's why that's why I'm more sympathetic to the love and light crowd nowadays. And I don't think it's all positive, but what I mean by that is the idea that, you know, I think there's something to the, there's something to the quote unquote woo woo side of a lot of these experiences that is never going to be measured in a laboratory, but is nonetheless evident. If you have two eyes and a brain in your head, like you can see personality changes in people. You can see people acting differently. You can see the way that people interact with others. And, um, I think that's that's a level of authenticity that a lot of these 14 disciplines, ufology and especially cryptozoology, but definitely ufology, have yet to really grapple with in any sort of meaningful way. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. When you talk about, you know, bag it, tag it, stick it in a museum. When you're talking about spirits, it's it kills me when people say, well, a hungry ghost looks like this. And a gray looks like that. And they're not exactly the same. And I'm like, you got to look at how they act. Illusion. What we see is deceiving. Always. Always. Look at Hinduism. They call it Maya. This entire world is Maya. It is an illusion. Um, even, Even Christianity says, by your fruits, by the fruits shall you know the tree. Exactly. You, you don't look at the tree. You look at what the tree makes or what the tree does. Um, and, and to me, that's kind of weird. You know, well, this is a ghost and that's a, that's a fairy and that's a spirit because this one looks like that. And that one looks like that. And that one looks like that. And I'm like, well, but even ghosts don't look the same to two different people standing next to each other necessarily. So... Well, and, and I think that if you look at, again, let's let's employ that ecology metaphor, that ecological metaphor. Are carrion beetles and fungi the same thing? No, they're not. But they service similar niches. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one, I don't, I don't know about the, the microscopic implications of morality amongst carrion beetles, but <laughs> I'm sure a case could be made that one does so in a more altruistic way than another one. Well, once um, once they're eating something that's dead, it's dead. There's no morality to it. Right, right. I'm just trying to find a way that I'm I'm separating, you know, that I'm saying that different presences serve the same function but mm-hmm. might have different intentions or something behind them. But mm-hmm. they, again, different mechanisms too. So if you're looking at it within that sort of ecological perspective, I think that helps to sort of nest it. We're not talking about a phylogenetic tree. We're talking more about a holistic approach to the roles that these things serve. I think, um, mm-hmm. which, which, you know, allows you some, some leeway to say things like to, to make comparisons between hungry ghosts and some depictions of the greys, especially as you pointed out on this podcast, several, several months ago, I guess now, um, that, you know, uh, uh, Whitley Strieber's new interpretation of the visitors seems to speak to that body of folklore in a, in a pretty substantial way, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at the same time, then he, he, I, I worry about him sometimes. He, he, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. I mean, I mean, and that, that's something that you also can't ignore, too, is this almost like looming specter of Stockholm syndrome, you know, Um mm-hmm. And this idea that you're sort of making excuses for this thing. I mean, so I think, you know, people who read the book will see that I, I tend towards a an overall positive interpretation of this because, 
you know, working on the book made me rethink death in general. Like, and, mm-hmm. and we tend to think of death being the most negative thing that there is. And once you remove that being a negative from the equation, it sort of makes you say, well, I guess that the most evil things in the universe become lack of consent writ more broadly. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of troubling questions about that in the alien abduction lore. You find a lot of allusions to a lack of consent and a lot of English witch trial testimony and Scottish witch trial testimony uh, in, regarding fairies. Um, but again, I'm not saying this is the case, but a case could be made that maybe at a 10 million foot view, not even a 10,000 foot view, but a 10 million <laughs> foot view, right? That maybe we don't have the capacity to apprehend that something negative and non-consensual in these interactions might be for some greater purpose. And it doesn't excuse it. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse it. It doesn't excuse the lack of trying to convey that intention. Right. Um, But it, it's a possibility that I think we should entertain, entertain. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I definitely agree with you on that. Um, It's always been said that, that those who are immortal, have a completely different perspective. Those who perhaps live in a non-embodied fashion for a long time are going to have a different perspective than those who currently are embodied. That yes. is going to change their way of communicating and their priorities. So that may be part of what what we're seeing in this disparity. Yeah, and and I think that I mean, it, it it really comes down to things like you know, did you did you live your life well? Did you do something with it? You know, did you were you kind to others? Like you know, mm-hmm. I I think that those things you know, were were you, were you able to keep your family together? If your family is a positive force, sometimes families need to break apart, right? But I'm saying if you know if if you were the catalyst for that destruction, like. Those are the things that I think are the true moral quandaries that we have to grasp with. And and you see like how far we are into the weeds on some of these other topics. I know. Um, I know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that's not a complaint about, about our conversation, but I think it does underscore the fact that um, this ended up being a very personal work for me. Um, and I think, I don't I think maybe you can tell me if this is correct or not, but I, I feel like, a lot of this reads like Josh trying to figure out how to nest this within his own, his own, uh, his own faith and his own cosmology and stuff. You know, that's, that's the way that I felt. That's why I included a forward saying, let me, let me kind of clear the air about how I reconcile these things because, you know, um, still am a Christian just as we have discussed either a weirdo Christian or a, or a mystic Christian or a, um, or an animus Christian or Christian animus or something along those lines. But I think that, I think that this, this book really does harken back to that truism that Mike Clellan said that if, you know, if you're having a conversation about UFOs with someone and you don't get to these deeper questions, you know, maybe it's not the conversation you should be having about UFOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The UFOs are, are much deeper than just nuts and boltsy craft from another, I mean, even if they are from another planet, you know, even if they did come here in some kind of non-material spaceship, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. What matters is how it affects us, it, how exactly. we react to it, and what messages we take from it. I mean, so and, you long know, as they're not trying to eat us. Now, if they're trying <laughs> to eat us, and you know, I'm being all, you know, good or destroy the here. world, or yeah, yeah, that's well, different. But, different. But to, but to flip that on its head you know, to be more quote unquote offensive to my sensibilities, it doesn't matter if they're psychopomps. It doesn't matter if they're spirits. Again, we're coming back to like the function and what they say about us and what they say about, you know, how to live our lives and how to be really, Mm -hmm. um, I think is, is really what the phenomena is, is driving at. So, you know, in some ways it doesn't matter if they're aliens or if they're the old gods, um, it's still that call. It's the message, you know, I'm, I'm not enamored with the telephone. I'm enamored with the message that I get over the telephone. Right. Right. And then there's my dad who hates both the telephone and the fact someone's talking to him. on it. So, <laughs> you know, I've been there. I've been there. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, when you, 
when you talk about how to to what the message is, that's the important part. This comes back to the messages that people get from interacting with various non-human intelligences. And there is a great deal of similarity in these messages, which has been noted before. That's another reason why I've been kind of leaning towards, you know, these are all spirits that might be part of us or we're part of them or everything is connected with it, with each other, you know, but we're dealing with a spiritual uh, series of events. Yeah. I think that one of the most pernicious messages that keeps coming through time and again throughout the book is this idea of dying to death. Um, but even that, because the idea is that once you die to death, you're not really truly afraid of anything. But the and then part of that statement is is really where the meat is, right? You die to death, so you're not afraid with death, so you're not preoccupied with death. And you can focus on these other you know methods and avenues of enlightenment. Um, you can, say you can not be distracted um, by the sword of Damocles that holds that hangs over all our heads. Um, and that is something that you see time and again, you know, from the Eleusinian mysteries to a lot of psychedelic experiences, the NDE, the, the shamanic initiation, the alien abduction to a certain degree. Um, the number of abductees who come back and say that they no longer fear death is, is really quite striking. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's not only, um, it's not only, the important message that whatever this other intelligence is, is trying to get across to us, it's not only their most important message, but I think that it, an argument can be mustered that it's also the message that authority structures would like to um, undermine as mm -hmm. well. Um, because a population that realizes that is no longer subject to authority structures, you know, I mean, so, so because, you know, so what, I don't pay my parking ticket and, you know, a series of legal ramifications pile up that in, in with me in the electric chair. So what I've died to death, um, you know, maybe painful, but I'm immortal and, and there is no true sovereignty over my existence except for some sort of other higher power. Um, I think it's a very dangerous idea. And if you look at uh, power structures since literally at least Rome, um, they've been doing that to populations um, since that time. So that's some one way, you know, to sort of get around the disclosure question, like, you know, because the number of people who say, you know, why would they care if it's, it's got to be from, you know, it's got to be from Zeta Reticuli or, or why would they have a reason to cover it up? I think it's, you know, as I say in the book, which alters your day-to-day -day existence more profoundly, that life looks like close encounters of the third kind or that life looks like the Iliad. Like, you know, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I know my answer. I know my answer for sure. Yeah. The, uh, the whole question of disclosure is a big one right now. And, uh, I still, to this day, I'm like, why do you believe they're going to tell you the truth anyway? I mean, why yeah, have just... they told us the truth about, I mean, I grew up during Watergate, you know? I don't believe I don't believe that the government is going to tell me the the whole truth about anything. Well, you know, and we're in this post truth era as it is, where you know, if Donald Trump came out with a gray alien, half the country would say it was a lie, and if Joe Biden came out with a little gray alien beside him, half the half the you know country would say it was a lie too. So, I mean, there is there, there really we seem to have this problem with not knowing where to find truth anymore. And this is, you know, this is something that I, I had talked about with Whitley a while back was that, you know, that true disclosure isn't given to you. You find true disclosure. It's that mm -hmm. gnosis that we're talking about. You know, you have to convince to yourself that there's something else going on. And whether that means that you have undeniable experiences, which I would put you in that category more than me, or you have, um, you sort of Goldilocks your way there, which is more along the lines of what I've done. Either way, like that's the real disclosure that matters at the end of the day. It isn't, it isn't granted to you. Um, you have to take the initiative to, to find it yourself. And I think that that is sort of the realm that these phenomena are going to remain in. I don't think they want to, whatever they are, I don't think that they want to come out and make a big show of it. I think that they want to, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you really. 
you know, or, you know, obviously in the case of something like the aerial school sighting, like, you know, with 30 of you, but still it's not going to, I don't think it's going to happen at a, at, at a larger geographic level. I really don't. Well, just, uh, there was one alien who said, we want you to believe in us, but not too much. I think that was the Shermer abduction. Yeah. That's, yeah. And it, yeah, I love that out West, the, the police officer. Yeah. And, 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 uh, it's, it's that George P. Hansen idea of the phenomena self-negating and preferring to remain disreputable, preferring to remain in the shadows, you know, preferring to be the interest of kooks and artists and weirdos, you know. Um, and I really think that there's something to that. Um, I think that that book is just one of the most profoundly important things that's ever been written on the topic. And at the same time, I feel like one of the things that I, I, I go at great lengths to pursue, pursue in this book was kind of hinted at in, in the trickster in the paranormal by Hanson. But again, it's almost like the, a question that was left on the table, very similar to the way that Valet left the death question on the table too. Um, which is if there is such a striking connection between tricksters and psychopomps, and a lot of these phenomena appear tricksterish in nature, then can we say that maybe these phenomena serve in a function, either psychosocially or literally, as as psychopomps, as these beings that usher us through transitions and usher us across that final threshold? Um, and I was, you know, I was looking the other day, and like I've been, I didn't realize this until I was working on another project about a week ago, and I was looking through Thieves in the Night, which was in 2018. And I made mention of that idea just in passing. And I'm like, oh, I've been, I've been playing with this idea for a while. <laughs> and I finally, <laughs> I finally got it all out there. Um, so that's, that's another, that's another place to look. And then you start to see these similarities between psychopomps and, uh, and the UFO phenomena. But again, all paranormal phenomena writ large. And it's just, it makes you kind of go, well, maybe this might be part of what it's about. Like these things are appearing at these moments in time, not, necessarily because we're in a liminal time period but because they are the stewards to usher us through that liminal time period in some right. at some higher level right um, which i don't think i come out and say in the book now that i think about it that would have been good to have <laughs> to have made that assumption but oh well it's all it's all said and done it's fine <laughs> well hopefully people listen to this and go oh that's what he meant okay right. okay now we got it. well i'll write it down in the book you know yeah. That's what you do when you when you sign everybody's books. You should, you know, say that. Right, right. Have a stamp. Stamp it on there it's and then giant, sign your name. It's a giant eight and a half by eleven stamp. Yeah. And just stamp <laughs> it in the <laughs> Oh man. Yeah, yeah. You know, the 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 thing about it being about death, um, at least in my case, is when I started working on it. And and you did tell me it was going to be huge. And so it really wasn't a surprise. But I didn't really realize it until I printed it out because I edited it the old way with pen and paper because my computer was having issues with uh, your word processing, processing uh, app. And it just, it was having none of it. And I did not want my computer to do anything terrible. And it did. It, it lost me. I think two chapters worth of my work. And I was like, you know, that's these, fine. Yeah. I'm just going to print it out. So and, and these then chapters, I looked at these it. These chapters are not small chapters either. <laughs> I know. So God bless you. And then I looked at it and it's, and it's printed out for, but I was like, wow, that's the biggest thing I've ever edited. <laughs> but it was interesting because I started having synchronicities Pretty much since you asked me to work on the book, I had a series right. of synchronicities having to do with death and involving a uh, black and red checked flannel plaid wearing shadow man and holding a mirror and and then a, a cardinal bird and, and another cardinal bird and dreams about my ancestors, my my beloved dead. That happened right about when you asked me to to be part of the project. And then after I started editing, little strange things started happening. And in one day, three things happened. One, the kid and I were sitting 
in the television room because he wanted me to sit with him. And I was editing, even though I was sitting with him. And this horrible smell wafted into the room that smelled like something dead. And the kid looked at me and kind of curled his nose. And he's like, Mom, do you smell that? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, there's not another animal in here. It couldn't have been, you know, one of them farting or anything. What is it? And then about the time I stood up to move into another room to find it, it was gone. So there's this death smell that comes floating in. And, and then uh, I had just been reading and editing your, your passages about catabasis, which you should probably, you know, define for the, the listening audience, because that is not a word that is used in spelling bees and everyday speech. <laughs> So, now, and, it, and it's a theme that everyone is familiar with, I think, even though mm -hmm. they don't realize it. Um, the best example would be something like uh, Orpheus going to retrieve Eurydice. Um, it's this idea of, you know, it, apparently in Greek, it could also mean like travel down the coast for reasons mm -hmm. of enlightenment. But um, in, in the sense that I use it mostly in the book, it's about the descent into the underworld and, re and, re and resurfacing with enlightenment, which has been employed to great effect in the realm of psychology as you know the psychiatrist acting as psychopomp leading you down into the underworld of your subconscious mm -hmm. and you returning back with greater knowledge of yourself which again is something that we're is not only reflected in a lot of these ancient myths but is also reflected in all the contact modalities near-death experiences mm -hmm. especially where you come back and you have greater intuition greater empathy and all these sort of things so that's the basic idea right so i'd been reading and it was you know it, it wasn't as wordy as it's, uh, or redundant as it sounds, but it was catabasis, catabasis, catabasis. It was, you know, it, in this chapter, it was mentioned several times. So that was in my head. And the kid says to me while I'm trying to edit, hey, mom, there's this, this skirt. I want, I want this skirt. Could, could, can, can you order it for me? And I was like, yeah, give me the cash and I'll order it for you. Just send me the link. And I opened the link and the shop name was catabasis, which is not, your general yeah obviously I mean, it's they a hip have name clothes they it's have a hip name clothes so, I mean, you know yeah, yeah. so yeah uh, but i was just like oh what and then i you know won a, a few hours later i won an online scrabble game with <laughs> with the use of uh the word key and death <laughs> I use both of go. them in the same one, but yeah. Uh, so, yeah. oh, and the and the bracelet. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, at, which I'm wearing now. Uh, I had seen. I collect turquoise jewelry, and uh, I had seen this bracelet. It's by the artist um, Alex. I want to make sure I say it right. And she drops it and breaks it. No, she doesn't. Let's see, Alex Sanchez. That's right. I didn't want to say his name incorrectly and give the wrong artist, but it has spirals on it. It has a bear on it. It has a hand on it and some crosses and what are called raindrops. They're small uh, little circular dots and uh, a dragonfly. And I had been watching this, this piece on uh, Etsy for like two years year and a half, something ungodly. And I was like, oh, it's expensive. You know, I don't know. But when you gave me, you know, the money down for this job, I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to spend some of that on that jewel, on that bracelet. And I got it and I took it out and I looked at it. And then I was like, oh my God, this is about healing and life on one side. And on the other side, it's about death and resurrection. And so I was like, okay, okay, universe talking to me. All right. <laughs> and, All and right. That, I heard you. <laughs> that's been one of the most lasting things for me coming out of this process is that I look at the whole world differently. And I think that's really the the value in, in understanding archetypes is that you start to you start to intuitively know things and not in sort of a you know, I'm special sort of way, but like you start to to grok things a little bit differently than you than you would beforehand. Mm -hmm. A good example of this actually is um, my 
uh, the late, <laughs> unfortunately, HBO Max series Raised by Wolves, um, which has been canceled, unfortunately. Oh, but, no. Um, but uh, I, I like the series. I didn't always, I mean, obviously there's some mysteries that are set up that don't pay off, but and I but I didn't even in the moment really understand what was happening. But I also understood what was happening because, you know, you can apply some of those archetypes and say, oh, this is, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is the uh, the world tree, and this is the serpent, and this is the, the road to Damascus moment. Just th- these sort of things that you tend to see over and over again. And there's some things in this book, like you know, I will never look at birds the same again. I will never look at you know the uh, the Milky Way the same again. I will never look at um, some of these symbols that you just sort of take for granted. Suddenly, you f- take on a new meaning. At least they did for me, and and I it it sort of. I guess and this is sort of a passe thing for me to say at this point, but it kind of re-enchants the world a bit, you know. Um, you start to perceive these the sort of hidden lattice work that lies underneath things. Um, and speaking to the synchronicity thing specifically, um, I have a suspicion that the book might be a minor synchronicity generator. Um, it was... I, I, I embarked on this journey after what was easily the most turbulent and also synchronistically charged uh, time period of my life, which maybe I'll talk about that at some point. Um, I have here and there if people know where to look. Um, But uh, I think that that is not insignificant detail when you're writing a book about death. And I've had some inklings from some other friends of mine who have had some dreams that are closely tied to a lot of the themes of this book as well. So I kind of suspect that maybe people might have that happening in their lives once they start reading it. Um, (laughs) That's a good sales pitch, right? Um, (laughs) I don't know if I'm going to read that book. (laughs) Right, right. Well, and you know, I I, I remarked on this to you and I'm saying it here. So I, so nothing will happen. Knock on wood, but um, I've had the, the roughest health road that I've had in a long time uh, this year, the same year that I'm releasing these two books. Um, and I don't know if that's somehow related to it. Nothing again, knocking on wood, nothing, um, nothing serious, but just a a litany of things coming up. And it's like for Pete's sake, you know, um, you know, things that just were out of my control. Now, obviously part of that is the fact that I have two toddlers who went into preschool for the first time this year. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and they bring home everything, but it's also just like, you know, those, those surgeries that you think you might have to have at some point that just all sort of come collapsing down at once. You're like, okay, okay, I'll do it. But it's all like here within a, you know, a three week time span or something. Yeah. So it's, been, it's been one of those seasons of life, which I think really ties into that, um, ties into some of these greater themes. So I wonder if it's not playing itself out in my life a little bit right now as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that there's the possibility for, for this book to sort of have a synchro mystic cloud around it. I don't know reaching through the internet and getting people we'll see um there's there's just so much in the book you know i you know there's part of me that's like god there's so much in it and i've read it now twice at least twice twice um but there's parts of it i've read three times because i was when i was picking chapters for you to send out to Mm. people um, for them to look at. So there were some chapters that I've read three times. Yeah. Um, I crunched the numbers very quickly and very cursorily, but, um, I think it's a third, the length of the Bible, (laughs) 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 which is not a selling point, but there it is. Um, Uh, yeah. Yeah. But you know, when we came together to talk about it, there was part of my brain that's like, it's so much, what are we going to say? Yeah, I, no, and I, then you said same, the same yeah. thing. I'm like, all right, now you wrote it. You got to know what to say. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but well, I it's, understand. It's such a journey, and the time depths that we're dealing with go so deep, um, and the archetypes are so widespread that it really is, in some sense, like just hard to wrap your wrap your head around. Um, uh, I do suspect that. Um, well, see, I don't, again, I'm running into the same problem here because I wrote the damn thing. I don't even know where to begin. Um, yeah, so book one is is more or less those ancient soul traditions and, and tying in some fundamental concepts, which I think have gone overlooked um, by a lot of people involved in sort of uh, the mainstream 14 disciplines. Um, 
the very first thing I did in this project, because I was toying around with what to do next, and I was trying to avoid doing this project <laughs> for so long because I knew it would just be so much stuff, you know. And NDEs are not really my bag. OBEs are not really my bag. So I knew that there was going to be a crash course that I had to require with that. And Anyway, um, the first thing that I did was I reached out to the classics department at the University of Georgia, and I literally copy-pasted the same email to... Uh, to each of the professors. And I said, can you point me in the right direction for finding resources on the idea of the soul as being small and or winged? And I would say about two thirds of them responded and about two thirds of that two thirds was, was very kind and, 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 and helpful. Um, but once I, rolled up my sleeves and got into the nitty gritty of this, I was surprised to see how widespread those ideas were of the, the winged soul and the small soul. But most of them were from indigenous cosmologies. And mm -hmm. I think that speaks to a disconnect that you find in academia nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that you could have a classics department where, you know, there are examples of small and winged souls, but no one, A, a no one cares about it, and B, they sure as heck don't know, that they can't draw that connection to even earlier peoples that had mm -hmm. those those concepts. Um, but I think both those concepts are important to establish because um, they speak directly to, you know, fairy folklore right off the bat. The wing thing, yeah, I go into that a little bit and how that's sort of confusing, but it, but it, while the wings with fairies are an artistic flourish, it seems to be a well-grounded intuitive artistic flourish in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fairies were always granted powers of levitation, but not granted powers of flight until, you know, I think Blake or Fuseli or something. Um, but I think that, that, uh, that also, you know, as, as go fairies, so go aliens, but also you, it reframes those interactions that Whitley has with Anne in the form of a white moth in a really interesting and new way. Yes. And then you start to see how this spider web of connections branches out from even just two of those ideas that are, that are that simple. Um, you know, the idea of the descent to the underworld being another one, the idea of polypsychism is a huge part of this book, um, which yes. people might not think is directly related to death. But again, if you're talking about souls, and an ecology of souls, you've got to talk about yourself. And, and uh, so, yeah, polypsychism and the idea of doubles and doppelgangers are a huge part of this. Um, and, you know, some of these ideas I was really reticent to pursue. Um, even though I've always had a weirder idea about what these phenomena represent than a lot of people, I still pull back and grimace. And I probably would today if I talked to someone honestly. Um, experiencers don't hold this against me, but I still pull back and grimace a little bit when people start talking about pre-birth agreements and their alien abductions and the idea of, you know, yeah. dual souls and the idea of, uh, of, you know, reincarnation stories. It's just, it's, it's so, it runs so contrary to what we've been spoon fed. I, I, I suppose partially I'm just a victim of conditioning. Like we all are regarding that, right? Like it's, it's one thing to step away and say, well, maybe it's not extraterrestrials behind the UFO phenomena, but then it's another thing that, <laughs> that really is unpalatable to us to say, maybe they're part of this process. But, you know, I, I think that, I think that whenever, whenever I personally find anything that, that, for lack of a better term, triggers me or that I don't really like looking at, I force myself to look at it, whether it's politics or religion or, you know, the UFOs, right? Um, and I think that because these stories aren't going away, right? I mean, <laughs> these yeah, stories yeah. are not going away and they're there. And if you're going to have a robust idea of what lies behind the phenomena, you have to incorporate it. And I don't, I think it's disingenuous as it is with people saying that they have weird Bigfoot encounters to just throw out these reincarnation alien stories, you know, just right. throw them into the dustbin. So that was part of, of trying to, uh, part, one of the things that I was trying to do was to, to make that, to, to sort of reconcile that. But that does lead you into another idea that I find unpalatable, which is the reason that I brought this up which was that polypsychic idea that sometimes the, what the phenomena is, is an extension or an aspect of ourselves, perhaps one of our wandering souls or our doubles. And I, you know, my little, my inner child who loves playing with, you know, monster toys hates that idea, right? It sounds almost, uh, 
I mean, it's an exotic and fantastic idea, but it sounds almost anticlimactic, you know, to go from aliens visiting us to well, maybe it's not aliens to, well, maybe it's spirits to, well, maybe it's just part of me. Um, and that isn't to say it's in your head or anything. I go at great lengths to dispel that notion, but I think there's a lot of evidence that in at least some of these cases, these things are a reflection of us and a part of us that we have yet to fully recognize and integrate in our modern thoughts about the way that the soul works. Yeah. I I've been, you know, talking about unpalatable things. I've been reading up on alien abduction uh, because I got creeped out so horribly by communion. And then what was the next one? Transformation. Uh, that, and then I read, you know, a few other authors, Bud Hopkins and, uh, one book by David Jacobs. And, and I was so distraught. Bless you child. (laughs) Some of their, their techniques for one Mm -hmm. thing of, of hypnosis, it just bothered me, but really, I, I love you, Whitley, no shit, but you creeped me so horribly out that for years I was just like, you know what? I'm just not going to even try. I'm not, I'm not even going to try. Well, you know, I've gone back now. And so I'm reading these things and I'm wondering, you know, some of this could be our own psyches, our own, uh, unresolved. I don't want to say issues because that's like, it's sort of dismissive, but I know what you're talking about. It, and and, tra- and trauma is too specific. Yeah, um, because it isn't always traumatic, but it, it's some part of us that tells us a story so that we can understand ourselves better. Our unresolved conflict, our unresolved struggle. Yeah, yeah. so that we can move forward and just in a better understanding. You know, generally, if you understand yourself, you can understand other people. A lot of places where we get into problems psychologically with anger issues or um, fear responses is because we don't understand the root of those within ourselves. So that's why you go to therapy and you do the things. Why projection is a thing, right? Yeah. 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 And you, you do, you know, the work with your psychologist as the psychopomp taking you to the underworld and you dig it up and you figure it out and then you come back and you understand once you understand yourself, you do understand other people better. So sometimes I do wonder if, you know, the, these, these, some of the alien abductions, I'm not saying y'all didn't have your experiences because I'm never going to say that to anybody. But sometimes I wonder if some of what has happened to me isn't a part of my brain, either trying to protect another part of me or trying to understand what is happening in a pre-literary um, state, you know, before someone can read or even speak very well, pre-language state. So maybe that's part of what's going on with some of this, you know, stuff. And then there's the part of me that's like, well, you know, whatever the other is, it kind of wants us to have a belief that they come from space right now. That's <laughs> yeah, their new, yeah, yeah. that's what they want us to do. And maybe they're making a new religion because the old one isn't working so well anymore. The old ones are not, we're not feeling like we're taking care of the earth as much. And maybe, you know, that's part of their goal and maybe that's what they want us to do. So space. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give the humans something to look up at and dream about and move towards space. Yeah, we'll be from space. But see, again, that's that's a call towards mankind. I mean, it's a very McKenna-esque idea, right? It's, it's a call towards mankind to struggle through this birthing process and to emerge from the chrysalis of the Earth into the stars as mm-hmm. well. And, you know, all those things that you said you would want yourself to do too, right? Like you would want Mm -hmm. yourself to be a better steward of the environment. You would want yourself to Mm -hmm. become more in touch with things and be more compassionate. So, and and at the same time that we're saying that these phenomena might be a part of you, they can also be a part of something else too. And I think Mm -hmm. that's to, to sort of divorce oneself from this, this false dichotomy, I think, is is a really important and difficult thing to do. Um, but I think the idea that there's this 
giant reservoir of soul um, from which of which we are a part and separate, but also connected to that may have actually come from aliens from Zebel Ganubi, right? Like they, their, their energy gets thrown in there too, you know? Right. Um, and was also once, you know, a cat, a frog and a dog um, and a witch on a broom. Um, <laughs> that's a children's book reference. I've been reading too many children's books. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that that's, that's, that's a very potent idea. And so, you know, I'm sure there are going to be people who read this and say, well, is it, is it us or is it not us? Cause you go back and forth and you contradict yourself. Yes. Yes, I do. Because my mind's not made up. And I think that in some ways it doesn't necessarily have to be because I don't think that's necessarily the most elegant model for what we're seeing. Um, at the same time, I made this remark and I think that you said that you had thought about it too, is how often are an experiencer's primary contact of the opposite sex? And what does that say about the experiencer? So in other words, how many alien abductees who are male have female handlers? Well, that's certainly the case for Whitley. I mean, like he mm-hmm. goes great lengths talking about this, this female presence that has been with him, you know, as a, to use a Robert Kirkism as a co-walker um, mm-hmm. through his, uh, through his life. And yet at the same time, you know, David Jacobs in the threat, which, you know, I'm not, not here as a David Jacobs apologist or defender, but he has influenced the way that we thought about these phenomena. Um, uh, categorizes all of his experiences with female pronouns because most of them were female and most of the handlers, the alien handlers in the, in, the, in that book are male. So you see this idea of, of the divine perhaps repressed um, opposite the, the yin to the yang sort of emerging. And Well, Jung would say that's the anima and animus. Right. Exactly. That, that lives within everyone and uh advises uh in and a, I, it, what what is at the heart of this book though i think is monis the the theory the understanding of monism it is that we are all a part of a larger thing that the spiritual realm our energy our spiritual energy is all part of everything else Everywhere, Absolutely. everything, all at once. Mich- we're all Michelle Yeoh. We're, <laughs> we're all, you know. I but, wish. I yeah, wish I, know, I was right? that cool. Um, no, I mean, and and you know, it it was one of those. I it was one of those thoughts that you because anybody who's reading the book, there's a mention of monism, and it's all thanks to Barbara that that I even got included. And I looked at it, and I'm like, this is again, this is the main problem with this book is that there's at least so many of these big ideas that you can only sort of touch upon fleetingly because you're just trying to establish the fact that there is a connection between death and soul and all these modalities that you don't allow yourself the time for the deep dive into these other things. But that's that's an excellent point, and it's what you see time and again. And you know, um, I believe uh, Jack Hunter was talking about this in an interview one time about how. Um, and I included r- references to this in the book as well, um, that, you know, for a long time, there was a search for a Prisca theologia, the idea that somehow you could find your way back to the earliest interaction of humankind with God, and that would be the purest version of it. And, you know, the philosophers went back and forth, and they said, there, I, we can't find it. Maybe it's Neoplatonism. Maybe it's this, <laughs> maybe it's that. And the reality of it is, is it's probably animism and shamanism like that's mm-hmm. probably what prisca theologia is because those ideas just keep coming back time and time again and those are i mean i'm sure some people would press back against this and i'd be more than willing to listen to their to their responses but if you wanted to broadly generalize those concepts they are at least more monist than a lot of the western religions that we have nowadays especially mm-hmm. the Abrahamic religions, even though, even though there are allusions to, to that throughout Abrahamic religions, you know, and, <laughs> the, like, and like, the mystic yeah. branches of those religions tend to yeah. groove with the monism much better than the, the it's, other orthodoxies. It's the message that keeps getting muddied. You know, I mean, the kingdom of God is within yourself said Christ, you know? Um, and, and yet that, that message somehow gets lost. And, uh, yeah. 
And I'm sympathetic. And I, you know, again, as a Christian, I'm sympathetic to why that message is getting lost because I think it's very easy to take that in the wrong direction and mm-hmm. to justify a lot of bad behavior and to, you yes, know, and to self-aggrandize. Yes. Um, but at the same moment. I think that uh, the divinization of the self is what we've in a lot of ways been trying to get to in our sort of overly secularized, disconnected from soul um, environment that we find ourselves embedded within. Like, I think that's you know, what all these self-help books are trying to get at. And I think it's what, you know, the, the capitalist seizure of mindfulness is trying to get at. <laughs> yes. Um, well, and it's, and it's, you know, I think there's a more authentic way to, to reach that point if people would just listen to some of the secondary meanings within these things. Yeah. 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 Monism and, and, and yet at the same time, separate yet apart, you know, we're all a part of something and separation is an illusion, but it is the illusion that we have to work with in the material realm. And so you have to kind of be able to have in your head two different opposing ideas at once and be comfortable with both and instead of either or. Right. Um, we're not so great with the either or. Well, and you know, I, I think there is the something West to be said. Particularly. One of my favorite memes that I've seen is um, some. It is, there's a tide rolling in. And over the tide, it says reality. And there's a guy hammering nails into the sand where the tide's coming up. And it says language. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I really appreciate that meme. But And I think that's sort of getting towards what you're getting at. Like, these are insufficient tools. But, you know, at the same time, we have to, you know, to, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, of all people, go to, go to war with the army that we have. And the army that we have... Are, are these tools they are language you know either otherwise we just sit down and just wonder which actually may not be such a bad thing but i would i would prefer to try to sort of sift and winnow our way towards a, a greater understanding yeah yeah exactly so yeah. it's it's an it's an incomplete impartial problematic way to try and grasp what's going on but it's it's one of the best tools that i think that we have yeah i Again, uh, one of my one of my thoughts on this was uh, perhaps the planet itself is a giant well of souls, mm-hmm. and it has an overarching consciousness of itself, and it is communicating with us through pieces of its souls, and sending us synchronicities, and you know trying to have dialogue with us i think in the west we've really forgotten how to do that and it may be that alien abduction is is how to get through to thick skulls maybe i don't I mean, know to a, to a certain degree i mean from that perspective alien abduction and our preoccupation with space is something of a distraction, right? I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's taking our way attention. It's our take, taking our attention away from what we're doing here. It's saying, well, you know, if we, if we burn through this planet, we can go to the next one. It's, it's, it, it just sort of, I think it's a little bit dismissive of, of what we're embedded in now. So I think a case could be made that the alien abduction experience is somehow trying to shift our focus away from that in some capacity. Of course, you know, running contrary to that, you have these, uh, what I, what I call the guy in life previews, which are, you know, mm-hmm. the, they're the inversion of the, the, uh, life reviews that you see in NDEs. So life reviews are intimate moments from the past and guy in life previews are collective moments from the future. Right. So, mm-hmm. and they're so always like, disastrous. Yeah. Always disastrous. It's never, Oh, it's going to be great. Always disastrous, often predicted for the near, near future, never come to uh, never come fruition. To pass. Exactly, yeah. But it does instill that sense of urgency, right? You know, mm-hmm. um, because the best time to plant a tree was yesterday, and the best time to plant a tree is today. Um, but you know, I think that's something that you see if you look at this stuff long enough. You do see this idea of inversion being representation, um, which is mm-hmm. an idea that I talk about. And if anybody's musically inclined, if you have the pitch. C- of a sounding above a C it's a major sixth. If you have a C sounding above an A it's a minor third. They're the same pitches displaced for octave, obviously, but they're completely different intervals and not really uh, interchangeable from a music theory perspective. And I think that's a pretty, 
I have found that to be a good way to wrap my head around things like, you know, the uh, changelings are imperfect children that um, live with you while hybrids are perfect children of yours that don't live with you. You know, it's, they're completely mm -hmm. opposite things, but they're expressing the same motif because they have the same sort of components. They're just inverted. Mm -hmm. Or the idea that the fairies are always leaving and never here while the aliens are always, sorry, the fairies are always leaving, but never gone. And the aliens are always coming, but never here, which is a, a right. Patrick Harperism. And I think that idea of, of the, the life review in NDEs versus the guy in life preview is another example of, of that happening. Um, and the idea that it could be some sort of guy and energy reaching out to us, I, I actually find very appealing. You know, they make a little bit of a reference in the ley lines chapter. <laughs> Good Lord, mm -hmm. this, book, this book talks about everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I make a reference in the Ley Lines chapter um, to, to the idea that some people have said, like, well, you know, if, if we extrapolate um, the idea of, you know, something like Chinese energy and that most famous of all Scrabble words, Qi. Um, <laughs> QI, y'all. QI. QI. Yeah, yeah. It's like. No you <laughs> necessary. Yeah. It's, it's, it's when you're down, when you're down and out and you've got that those 10 points staring you in the face and you're like, what do I do with this? Just slap it on an eye and you've got a word. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. The idea that if we extrapolate that same life energy to a larger system like the earth, then maybe ley lines are the equivalent of Gaia and acupuncture that are tapping into these powers. Um, I think there might be something to that. I think that it's, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit, uh, it, it's, it's almost like simulation theory in, in the way that it's this, very human idea i think that we've sort of mapped onto a broader system and just assuming that it would work like that at the same time it's it's very hermeneutically sound right i mean as above so below um mm -hmm. it would make it would make a great deal of sense um but yeah people are, people are going to listen to this and have no idea what the book's about <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's 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 not because again, Barbara and I were going back and forth about how are we going to talk about this. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a criticism of of the way our conversation is going because this is a lovely conversation, and I think it's all about the book, but it's also it's about all the other yeah, things too. Yeah, it's it's just it's just vague enough. <laughs> um, so would you would you like to walk people through kind of the chapters right quick to give them an idea? Of yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's let's walk. Yeah, through. you got it. You you got it called up. But let's go. Yeah, we can um, do that. So uh, there's an introduction, as so many lovely books have. Um, but there's also a, a, a quick crash course in near death experiences and out of body experiences, um, and just sort of a lay of the land. So you know, people are going to be reading this and being like, "Yeah, I know this, Josh. Get to the point." Um, I think it starts to take off a little bit more with the Psychopomps chapter, which talks about these figures throughout all mythologies, which happen time and again, that are often but not always tricksters um, who usher us to the other side. And uh, some really cool examples of Psychopomps appearing in some near-death encounters. Um, and then... Chapter three is these ancient soul traditions that we were talking about. The idea of the, the winged soul, the small soul, the bird soul, um, the themes of descent and ascent and polypsychism. And then we have two fairy chapters, um, which I think there is an argument to be made that human beings tend to give all supernatural creatures the same suite of abilities. So perhaps the fact that fairies behave like ghosts is not as important as it might seem. And I would entertain mm -hmm. that. I would, I would entertain that, that criticism. Um, but at the same time, if we are going to ascribe any value to firsthand testimony from informants, there do seem to be plenty of instances where people are recently departed who appear among the fairies. Um, mm -hmm. And you find and not that, just in the 19th century or, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Like one of my favorite stories actually comes from Simon Young's fairy census, where he talks about uh, a vicar who was being drug away by the fairies. <laughs> like there's a, <laughs> there's a girl reading her in her backyard in like County Sligo or something. And, and she looks up and it's, it's the, it's the, it's the vicar who had just died like a week earlier and he's being pulled away by his robes by these little fairies. And that's, it's creepy. It's kind of funny. Um, but it also speaks to that psychopomp idea and, the, and exploring mm -hmm. the idea that fairies are psychopomps is not, I feel like it might even be a little bit of dangerous territory um, in the sense that it's, 
not something that is really that well thought of as a possibility. I remember I had a conversation with Morgan Daimler and she's like, well, you know, psychopomps are altruistic and fairies are not <laughs> altruistic at all. So, but having said that, there are some comparisons to be made there. Um, so there's a chapter that talks about that, the number of fairies that appear as death omens and altered states of consciousness is the next chapter. <clears throat> um, something I was really surprised to find out in the course of my research, um, which you may have known this Barbara, but I sure as heck didn't is the number of indigenous mythologies that say this was a gift to us to explicitly contact the dead or the land of the dead. Like I didn't realize that was as widespread a belief as it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, you know, um, ayahuasca being possibly the vine of the dead. But also, you know, when you talk about ASCs, you're talking about dreams, which are another vector for spirit communication. So we have to talk about dreams now. You see why this book got so big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, the visitations of loved ones who've died in dreams and death premonitions in dreams. So, um, and then sh talking about shamanism and how that is, among other things, a belief system that is often preoccupied with putting the living in right relation with ancestors. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, then you know, honestly, Barbara, I think my two favorite chapters, especially in that first book, are the uh, the the, the uh, mountains and monuments chapter and the wild hunt chapter. Um, yeah, because I'd always wanted to to dig into ancient monuments, and when you live in a place as dotted with ancient monuments as the British Isles, or I would dare say America it re-enchants the land in such a cool way. It oh really yeah. Was. Um, yeah. And like, you know, I mean, so there are a couple ways to look at it. You know, part of, part of the, what this book does is it tries to rescue some problematic ideas, <laughs> right? Yes. So I talk yes. about, you know, the extinct race hypothesis in regards to fairies and how, well, yes, that's racist, but there's another way to look at it. That is a little bit more understanding that might be speaking to a similar truth. Um, not going to go into that here because it's a little bit, it's a little bit involved, but another idea that is equally problematic is this idea of the Indian burial ground. And, you know, yes, I'm, well. a, I'm, a, I'm of two minds about it though. Right. Because like it's overused and it demonizes indigenous people and all that. But at the same time, like there's meat on those bones, you know, mm -hmm. um, there, there is something to it. I don't necessarily think that Keel's window theory which is the idea that UFO sightings tended to take place within 200 miles of a major archaeological site, which, you know, is a, is a huge, <laughs> it's a That's huge a diameter window. to draw. Um, but, uh, but I, I think there's something to that idea. And so trying to reconcile that with also the fact that any post-colonial nation is just going to be a graveyard anyway. Yeah. Um, so just so so a lot of that chapter was trying to deal with that and also like taking a look at and I don't know how many people have done this in a responsible manner um but taking a look at um some of the North American mounds and saying well honestly these look a lot like fairy mounds like you know having been to both of these types of sites like it's uncanny you know I can show you a picture of the Etowah mounds you know, pre excavation and a picture of a fairy fort from, you know, County Cavan and they look identical, you know? Um, so the idea that, you know, maybe there were once Irish settlers who walked by these mounds and felt a shiver up their spine. Mm -hmm. We thought we yeah. left them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, if anybody can find a diary entry talking about that, I that would, would be amazing. absolutely love that. I've, I don't know if one exists, but I can't imagine that they could have walked by some of these sites and also heard a lot of the indigenous little people lore, which is, it's so congruent with old world fairy lore that it either is an objective reality or it's cultural contamination, right? It's one of the, other. and they, they haven't found definitive cultural contamination. Right. So that's, Yeah. And then you know, in the in the southeast, especially the association of the Nanyanahi with with 
what were burial mounds, like the exact same yeah. thing that you find yeah. in, in, you know, in Western Europe is, is really uncanny. So this chapter sort of examines and rescues some of those ideas. And then that naturally leads you into ley lines and this idea that spirits travel in straight lines and how that speaks to some of the older ufological ideas like orthotony, but also ideas like the wild hunt, which was in some instances, you know, uh, means for the dead to be collected from across the landscape, but also might be helmed by your double or, you know, your double mm-hmm. might join the wild hunt. Um, and how that speaks to, you know, the, 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 the some of these shamanic ideas as well. Um, and then, and then it's UFOs. So, there we- <laughs> um, and then the next book, we just go with you. It's just UFOs. Yeah. Um, but specifically, you know, pointing out the similarities between, well, you know, reconciling some of the physical aspects of abductions with the fact that a lot of them look like they take place in the astral plane. Um, they just do. Um, but there are examples of people's cars being abducted. So how do you sort of figure that out? Um, mm-hmm. The after effects that people experience, um, you know, the sort of focal point of a lot of the book, which is the instance of um, the dead showing up either aboard UFOs or during periods of heavy UFO contact, which is not only the focal center of the book, but also not in the book. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Barbara and I uh, were talking about this and I didn't make this decision until I got to this chapter, but um, I just, I'm looking at like 50 reports, which the original plan was to go to rice and to go through the Strieber letters and stuff. But then the pandemic hit and it was like, okay, well I've got 50 of these anyway. And I know that there are more in the in the archives of the impossible. So let's just stick with the 50. Um, but they're not in the book because that would be another, you know, <laughs> large, <laughs> chunk. another chunk. So what we, what I've done, um, and this was both the idea of Barbara and Mike Cleland, who was helping out with uh, some of the design aspects of the book um, is we have included. So the book contains all the chapters and the index, but the end notes are in, a companion book. Now, before you get upset, let me finish. Um, The end notes are in a companion book. Three appendices are in the companion book. These are dead who are unknown to the experiencers showing up aboard UFOs and during periods of heavy UFO activity. Dead who are known, so like loved ones, relatives, etc., who are known to the abductees and experiencers who show up aboard UFOs and in periods of, of heavy UFO contact and UFOs seen around cemeteries and graveyards. Those three appendices, the end notes and the bibliography are available in a companion book that can either be purchased or downloaded as a PDF for free from my website. And it's especially, you know, quick to do in the ebook because you just click on the link and it takes you right to that landing page. Um, so, you know, I wanted to do something that would be, I wanted to not, I wanted to shorten the book. I wanted to keep the book shorter. Right. (laughs) But I also wanted to, um, provide this information, but I also didn't want to make people buy a third book. So this seemed like the best way to have my cake and eat it too, while also appealing to people like myself who want to have stuff in the physical world here in meat space. So buy it, download it, et cetera. Um, so there's that. And then we talk about some of the ideas of probably another one of my, probably my favorite chapter of the second book is the soul craft of ufology chapter. That's um, a really good one. Uh, which talks about. That's one about... of the ones I read three times. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm especially proud of that one because I think it, it is a pretty comprehensive look about, you know, the sort of things that the UFO can be because I t- I've always talked a lot about, it, you know, the occupants and I've always been like, yeah, and the craft themselves, stuff, whatever, you know, <laughs> I've, sort of, I've sort of always waved my hands, right? Because it's the, if you're nesting this within fairy folklore, it's kind of the most difficult thing to reconcile, although not impossible, but it's the most difficult thing to reconcile. Um, and it's the thing that the extraterrestrial hypothesis folks always like to point to and say, you know, well, what about the fact that it's structured craft? So the soul craft of UF, of, UF, of UFOs chapter is um, examining, you know, the idea of the UFO as a soul, the UFO as uh, a double, um, you know, the fact that it might be your externalized soul or it might be a soul of the dead or some of these ideas which are the weirder idea is the idea that it might be a reinvented version of the psychopomp's boat, which is a very common psychopomp symbol, or 
the weirdest idea that runs throughout both books, which is the idea that it's no, it's actually a ship, but it's a ship built in the afterlife that comes and takes you <laughs> to the afterlife, right. which sounds crazy, but like it's been running through ufology since at least the fifties. Um, and uh, there's some striking evidence to suggest something like that is going on. Um, I was over the moon when I found out what Willie talked about in a new world with um, mm -hmm. where he decided that, he supposedly encountered these two men who told him that his implant was not necessarily from the visitors. It was built by Constantine Rod Rodeve, um, famous EVP pioneer. And he built it and designed it in the afterlife. Like, <laughs> I love that idea so much because it's just the wildest idea. So sort of exploring some of those ideas of the afterlife as its own technologically advanced civilization. And the idea of the aliens as others, aliens as ourselves, and then uh, the icing on the cake, I think, is the uh, the cryptid chapter, which is just a lot of fun. And uh, the epilogue, which I didn't want to be an epilogue at first, but Barbara said it should be an epilogue, so. Yep. Yep. It makes sense. It, it really does make sense to be the epilogue, so... Um, so yeah, so that's, that's sort of an overview of the book. Um, sounds a little bit convoluted, but it, it kind of does all fit together. It just does not fit together in a reader's digest sort of way. <laughs> I, you know, other than being flippant, the only way you could make this a short book is to say UFOs and all the other paranormal stuff has to do with death. Boom. End of story. There you go. I, I mean, and you can't uh, yeah. read a book like that. That's crap. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I say in the section where I compare UFOs or rather aliens to psychopomps, I say, I, I literally say like, this is a weird idea to build a case for it. You have to be very slow and deliberate and thorough. Like you have to mm -hmm. make that idea, you know, palatable, like we we're talking about. Um, and hopefully I do that. You know, if you're not bought in <laughs> by halfway through the second book, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but uh, I think there are some comparisons that can be made to specific things. Um, and, you know, this, again, this, I never could really personally understand some things like dog man. Like, how do I fit that and figure that out? And you had some ideas and I had come to some other ideas that just, I'm like, oh, this actually, I can now nest this within the greater picture if I apply mm -hmm. this guiding principle of death. And that's what I think is Again, I don't know if this is quote unquote correct or not, but I think that's what's especially attractive about the ecology of souls model is that it has a place for everything, you know, and you can make these, mm -hmm. these puzzle pieces, you know, if they don't fit snugly, at least they're not a complete mismatch. Like they felt like they once were for me, but something like dog man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I liked the, uh, I liked the bits in the cryptid chapter about, uh, the lake monsters because I'd never thought of them in that way, but it makes sense. I hadn't either. You know, I hadn't either. And I guess we'll be a little bit coy about, <laughs> about yeah, what my conclusion yeah. I'm is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw a spoiler on it. So I, I if will you want to know, go read the book. <laughs> I will reiterate as I reiterate in the afterward, I am terrified of lake monsters now. <laughs> um, yeah. But th that was a real joy for me because I've never had the chance to write about lake monsters in any of my other work. You know, it's always just a passing thing and there's no real place to settle them. I'm like, okay, I'm going to talk about lake monsters and, um, a real um, guiding text for that for me was Michelle Merger's Lake Monster Traditions, which I think is going for like three hundred bucks on Amazon now. Um, yeah, it's it's I, it's really. I keep I keep pushing my friends in the publishing world to like get the rights to it and republish it because, you know, if you can get your hands on that book, it's fantastic. It's like as I've said, it's like Jacques Vallée for Lake Monsters. Like you know, <laughs> yeah. if if I would be so bold as to presume that where the footprints end is Vallée for Bigfoot, like that, I was like, well, maybe somebody should do this with Lake Monsters too. Nope, already been done. That it's a it's a fantastic book, um, but unfortunately, it's out of print. Um, but uh, I've got a lot of the the death related points in the book. So yeah, it's it, the book's a bit the the whole the whole work is a bit like Return of the King. It has like three endings, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But, uh, but oh, I, we all go home. The Shire's there. It's one away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. The, uh, headlessness is my scouring of the Shire, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but there that, you it was, go. yeah. But at the same point, like I just couldn't bring myself to excise that completely because I think it does tie a lot of loose ends together. That um, was actually one of the 
one of the things that I choked on and went, I, you know, you could probably get rid of that. And then you talked me out of it. And I went, well, okay, yeah. No, well, <laughs> You're well, right. I, I added some language and I found a way around yeah. it. But you know, yeah, it it, it when you, the way you first presented it, it was sort of sort of dangling, like you tacked know. on. It was tacked on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I think that um, you know, it it for me it was a way to sort of see what because you hear these stories about like obviously headless ghosts and things, but there are some really strange stories about headless aliens and, you know, Mm -hmm. abductees having their heads removed, which is obviously a shamanic dismemberment thing. But like some of these other stories, I'm like, you know, a lot of cryptids appear headless or there are literally giant heads. And I'm like, what's this obsession with the head and and the headlessness thing um, really opened it up for me. And once I found cephalophores, it was off to the races. So, Oh yeah. 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 Um, And that's ecology of souls. Um, if you made it that this far into the interview and said, what the hell is this book about? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, 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 as you can probably tell, and I, I, it's not in my, I, I kind of have felt like I've been bragging or something throughout this interview and that's not in my nature. And I kind of feel weird about talking about it this way, but like this book is the longest thing I've written. It took the longest to write, although it still came together shockingly quickly because i my wife was generous enough to allow me to treat it like a full-time job writing this thing but um it it's i didn't intend for it to be this but it is a snapshot on how i perceive the phenomena right now and i hope that in another six months that idea has changed um because you know our mutual friend greg bishop taught me a long time ago that uh if, if you're not evolving in your thinking, then you're probably doing something wrong, right? Like you're not learning, you're not, you know, your, your mind is calcifying, right? Um, so I hope that, I hope to have changed some ideas in this book. Uh, but right now, this is sort of like Josh's theory of the paranormal as it stands. Um, and it's weird and it's not entirely coherent, but it's the best insight that I can provide after having thought about it for, you know, five or six years. Yeah. I think, I, I think that's a perfectly good thing. The other thing I was going to say is it's not all about death births in there too, Mm. because you can't have one without the other. Right. Which is, you know, again, this is why the book's so long (laughs) because (laughs) Because you you can't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the death thing touches everything else. And, and uh, I think it was even the good Dr. Kripal who said that, uh, Death would not exist without sex, and sex would not exist without death, which, you know, makes you rethink the sexual obsession that so many of these phenomena seem to have. You know, if they're obsessed with death, then they've got to be obsessed with birth. And that's, you know, when you start spiraling off into these... That motif is in there. Yeah, it really is. It really is. So, you know, there's probably a better subtitle, like, The Cycle of Life and the Paranormal, you know, or something like that, but... Since you the would journey, have had to talk about birth more. Yeah, if you called it yeah. that, and yeah, so that so. it would be even longer. God no, so maybe not. <laughs> God no. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I, so that's that's in there too, and and really it does. There's sometimes when I read through it, where I say, you know, is this is this directly related back to death, but it's always something that's like, well, to understand that you have to understand this. And it eventually circles back around. And in those moments, I say, look, I know it sounds like we're, you know, wandering from the path here a bit, but, uh, but you know, this is important to establish, to make a connection to this, which then ties back into death. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I think that the only things that I really didn't grapple with were, time and time slips and i'm sure there's something else but off the top of my head that's the one thing we're just like this time time was the big thing that was that was omitted and with good reason because once you once you bring that into the equation then there that then you're bringing in physics and all kinds of other stuff and no it's another book (laughs) it's another book and and you know I, i i there are a couple points where i'm like yeah, the grays might be us from the future. That's a 
really cool idea. It fits. But I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah, but I'm not going to talk about it right here yet. (laughs) And at the end, you know, um, at your behest, when I reframed the the headlessness chapter as an epilogue, I sort of, you know, have a little bit of fun with it and say that it's kind of like here as a reader, you have an ultimatum, like the stay or leave ultimatum in the near death experience. Um, You know, you can close the book now, or you can see how this idea of the ecology of souls can take one motif in the paranormal and sort of provide a means of understanding it. And, uh, but also there at that point, I'm like, there are a lot of things that we haven't completely satisfactorily explained in this model. Time is one of them. The exact nature of the technological fetish of, of UFOs, I think is, is mm-hmm. one of them as well. Um, co-creation gets a name drop a lot in this book. Um, but even then, the mechanisms of that and how exactly that works. Yeah, there's a, there's some hand waving. But, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's got plenty of room for expansion and criticism, which is what I what I I, I like. You know, leave some stuff on the table. Yeah, yeah. Stuff on the table is always always good. Sorry, my phone's going off. Um. So yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's I I think I'm trying to think if if there's anything else well you know how do you how, how do you expect people will respond to this how do you hope people will respond to it and then how do you think they'll respond to it I hope people will say I hope people will walk away having internalized Anne's observation that's the most that I could hope for is that they see that there's something here, even if it's not as obsessively tied to death as the book makes it out to be, that's fine. But I think that some of these connections are as undeniable as things get in this field. Mm -hmm. That makes me sense. Um, So don't have to buy into the whole thing. Just say, yep, there's something there. Some of it's a stretch. Some of it's not, but, there's something there. That's my hope. The reality, um, <laughs> I think you said this. So so I had a friend, right? I had a friend who uh, introduced me to Curb Your Enthusiasm in college. And he said, do you like Seinfeld? And I said, yeah, I like Seinfeld. And he's like, good, because if you don't like Seinfeld, Curb Your Enthusiasm is like the distilled, <laughs> high-proof <laughs> version of Seinfeld, right? Like all the things that you like about it are heightened and all the things that you don't like about it are heightened, right? And this is... I feel like the Curb Your Enthusiasm version of Joshua Cutchin's books, right? Like this is like me going all out on some of the ideas that I play with in other books and completely overtly criticizing, rejecting the ETH and just really kind of not being apologetic about things at all. Um, And I realized that, right? I mean, is that a fair assessment? No, it's it's absolutely fair. Um, and yeah, you might get some you might get some ruffled feathers. Which yeah, and that's the realistic expectation is that there's going to be some people who think that this is fantastic, and I my my heart is warmed by that. There are going to be some people who see that there's some thread of legitimacy in here, and my heart is warmed by that. And there's going to be some people who reject it on face value and uh, and say. I think that's a dumb idea because they come from space. They tell us they come from space. They ride in spaceships. They come from space. Come on. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm never going to get through to those people. So no, no. it's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I did bring a lot of receipts. I brought over 4,200 receipts <laughs> at the end of the book. <laughs> um, but you're welcome. You're welcome to think that, you know, um, uh, yeah, so, so I think that's realistically the reception that's going to get. I don't think the cryptozoological community is going to even look at it. <laughs> um, Probably not. Because uh, there are plenty of pot shots there, too. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is preaching to the choir, I'm sure. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I hope that... Again, I felt the same way after Trojan Feast. Like, I want people to take the idea and, and carry it in different directions, you know? Like build off this and do a, do something on time, you know, like do some really roll up your sleeves and dig in. Cause, um, I'm excited by, you know, as, as stodgy and stale as the idea of, of where ufology is right now seems to be, um, there are plenty of avenues that 
hasn't been explored and I think people are just intimidated by how much um, interdisciplinary work they're going to have to put in to really grasp it. But if, if you do, I think that's where a lot of this meat might lie. Um, a lot of the answers might lie. Or new questions. Or new questions. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the idea that that's the other thing. It's like the idea that I've solved the paranormal or something. Like, I don't think any of this, um, any of this is ever going to be solved. You know, I had a, I have a, uh, I have an uncle who tells me the most outlandish stories. And, you know, every now and then you'll see something around this house where you're like, oh, that is a, picture of you with bill clinton huh um and then you know and then he'll tell you some other stories and you're like i don't know what to make of that and i think you know i think that the paranormal is probably going to be a lot like his stories like the ones that you the things that you think aren't true probably are true and the things that you think are true probably aren't true um and i think that as long as you can approach it with this idea that you're working towards your own personal disclosure and that you um and that you are at peace with the idea that you're probably not going to see any sort of widespread accepted answer to what's going on, then I think that's probably the healthiest way to approach these topics, honestly. That's a good closing statement. That's a good closing statement. Thank you so much, Barbara. For You are welcome. And thank for, you for having me on the on oh, the adventure of editing that book. Well, it has been a journey. And like I said, it couldn't have, uh, it couldn't have, come together without you and uh the fact that you would uh the fact that you would sit through rehashing it again here with me um i absolutely just my warms the cockles of my heart thank well you. i'm glad i'm glad and thank you for coming and talking about it and i hope everyone runs right out and reads it okay thank you. it is it is long but it is worthy of reading Thank you, Barbara. That, I say so. That means a lot. And everyone knows I am always right about what's <laughs> worthy of reading. That's true. And you're just as nice in person as you are on air. I can confirm that. So Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Is that a backhanded compliment? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all for this week's episode of the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast. If you have any questions or thoughts about the podcast or would like to come and talk about your experiences of the paranormal, you can contact us at 6djk67 at gmail.com. We promise to even answer you, and we are always happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you.